Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Welcome to our virtual Sunday Feast Talk. Today we're speaking from Sage Cottage in County Wicklow, Republic of Ireland. I'm Korma Das. Today we're reading episode number nine from our book, The Great Transcendental Adventure. And um, yesterday, or should I say last week, we um, were speaking from the chapter entitled The Great Transcendental Adventure. This is the name of the book and this is the name of the chapter. Great Transcendental Adventure Part 1, Chapter 2. This is um, Srila Prabhupada's pastimes in Australia and specifically 1972 in Sydney and Melbourne and New Zealand. Quite a, a big chapter and an exciting chapter uh, as well. So, Omagyana Timirandasya Gananjana Salakaya Chaksurun Militam Yena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Manobistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupagadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam. So, last time we read about how bearded beat poet Allen Ginsberg showed up at this Sydney temple uh, to meet Prabhupada one afternoon. Um, in early 1972 when Prabhupada was here in Australia or should I say there in Australia for his second visit. However, Prabhupada was taking rest at the time that he arrived and they told Alan that uh, you'll have to come back. Uh, he's taking rest right now. So Alan Ginsberg said, yes, I'll come back later. But Alan Ginsberg never returned. And that was possibly the last opportunity that he had to meet Prabhupada uh, at that time. The blue combi van was regularly being used to pick up Srila Prabhupada from his Rennie Street house. Prabhupada was living in a devotee's house uh, near the temple. Uh, Vyasadeva and Kalki had moved out and Srila Prabhupada was, and his entourage had moved in because there was uh, no room in the temple. And so Prabhupada was staying nearby, in, uh, in nearby Paddington. And this was Glebe, another suburb of inner Sydney. So Srila Prabhupada and the devotees traversed from Rennie Street to the temple in the blue combi van. And this was the evening program. Brahmacharis packed to capacity in the back of the van would hold a kirtan, sometimes chanting Hare Krishna and at other times the Sanskrit prayers to the spiritual master. We'd all hop in the back of the van and pick up Srila Prabhupada. Um, it was very, um, very intimate and personal. That afternoon, however, Srila Prabhupada agreed to be driven to the temple in the double-decker bus, even more exciting, the wonderful double-decker bus. As Raghunath uh, manoeuvred the lumbering vehicle, I, I was astonished that these double-decker buses didn't topple over. They always seemed so top-heavy, especially in these tiny little Sydney streets. Um, they were not meant to be driven in those tiny streets. They were meant for the big streets, but nevertheless... Um, Raghunath manoeuvred the bus um, to the temple, a uh, lumbering vehicle it's described as, certainly lumbering, and um, uh, up and down the hilly streets of Paddington to Glee. Prabhupada sat on a special soft vinyl covered platform. They made a special little Vyasasan for Prabhupada in the bus. It was constructed over the back wheel arch of the bus. And resting on two cushions, Prabhupada smiled broadly. It was obvious that he enjoyed the ride immensely. The uh, concept of a double-decker bus was thrilling to Srila Prabhupada. And he, he suggested to many other devotees around the world that we should also, they should also get a double-decker bus like had been done in Sydney. And some of them did. As Srila Prabhupada entered the front door of the temple, the devotees offered their obeisances and knelt on either side of the entrance corridor leading to the temple room. After an enthusiastic kirtan and before beginning his class, Prabhupada spoke to a packed room full of devotees and guests, repeating what he had said the first day that he had arrived. Uh, he was happy to see the deities beautifully dressed and well cared for. Krishna has given you the intelligence from within your hearts to look after him very nicely, he said. Many devotees and guests had come for the Sunday feast. This was the Sunday feast. Prabhupada spoke strongly from Bhagavad Gita and then asked for questions. 
The second or third question was more of a challenge. A bearded young man stood, claiming that Meher Baba was God, not Krishna. Not only was he saying that we're, we're all God, we're saying, he was saying that everyone is God except Krishna. That's a, a, one of the typical arguments. Yes, we're all God except Krishna. In an argumentative tone, he asked Prabhupada what he thought about Meher Baba. Mm, the audience was quiet and expectant. Srila Prabhupada looked lovingly at Radha Gopinath on the altar. I don't know anything about these people. I only know about Krishna, he said. Krishna is so wonderful that he lifted Govardhan Hill on the little finger of his left hand for seven days. As he spoke, Prabhupada smiled brightly, lifting his hand in the air with his little finger sticking up while he was looking at the deity. Prabhupada's eyes widened. He turned to the man. You can have Meher Baba. We'll have Krishna. He paused and turned to, to Gopinath on the altar. Krishna is very beautiful. You can take Meher Baba. We take Krishna. Srila Prabhupada uh, stood quickly, offering full obeisances before the deities as the devotees followed suit. So this was after the lecture. A kirtan commenced and Prabhupada walked towards the temple door. He turned and spoke out humbly to the bearded young man that had asked the question. Don't be misled, he said. Don't be misled. Krishna is very beautiful and you can know him. Devotees and guests escorted Prabhupada to his waiting combi van as they chanted in Kirtan. Then pots and buckets of prasadam were brought out of the temple, out of the kitchen, into the temple room for the ever popular Sunday feast. Before leaving for the temple that afternoon, Prabhupada had been sitting in his room talking with his senior devotees. Scholarly bespectacled Prajumna had come to Prabhupada with various technical questions on Sanskrit vocabulary. Prabhupada, as he often did, had turned the conversation into a fully-blown philosophical discussion. The devotees present had relished the opportunity of witnessing Prabhupada's exhilarating presentation of Krishna consciousness. And they were especially pleased that Prabhupada again invited them up to his room after the Sunday feast lecture. Prajumna, Shamasundara, Mohanananda, Nandakumar and a few others now sat expectantly before Srila Prabhupada. He appeared to have an endless store of energy and enthusiasm to preach. The devotees reciprocated by eagerly hearing from him, hardly noticing as the pinkish dusk sky darkened to blue and then black. By 11pm, despite their best intentions to stay awake, the assembled devotees could not hide their fatigue. As devotees started to nod their heads, Srila Prabhupada paused. All right, he announced, and the devotees rose to take rest. Still marvelling at Prabhupada's unquenchable preaching spirit, a few of the devotees left the house to return to the temple. Shama Sundara and Nanda Kumar, still a little jet-lagged, prepared to take rest in the servants' quarters. Shama Sundara had barely drifted off to sleep, when he again awoke with a start, Prabhupada was ringing his little brass bell and calling his name, Shamasundara. Shamasundara rose and entered Prabhupada's room. Yes, Srila Prabhupada, he asked. Prabhupada was grave. Sit down, he announced. But it was soon obvious to Shamasundara that Srila Prabhupada wanted nothing at all other than the opportunity to glorify Krishna. Shamasundara listened attentively. Monday the 3rd of April 1972. Srila Prabhupada spoke throughout the night. As the sun rose and some devotees arrived from the temple for Prabhupada's room, for Prabhupada's walk, Prabhupada was still talking with Shama Sundara in his room. Some devotees recalled the verse from the Bhagavad Gita, always chanting my glories, endeavouring with great determination, bowing down before me, these great souls perpetually worship me with devotion. So Prabhupada spoke throughout the night, non-stop. Remarkable, remarkable situation. Srila Prabhupada decided not to go on his morning walk. 
Mohanananda reminded him that reporters from a couple of TV stations were arriving soon. Uh, at 10 o'clock, in fact, to interview him. Prabhupada discussed with his disciples whether he should take a little rest beforehand because Prabhupada had not taken any rest that night. He decided to stay awake. After taking a light breakfast, he prepared to meet the media representatives. Prabhupada sat behind his low desk as the men from the press entered. Watching, Prabhupada was watching quietly as they set up their hot lights and large camera. Prabhupada appeared very grave as the large-bodied interviewer spoke up. Swami, we're, we're just going to ask you some questions, he said. May I ask you questions, asked Srila Prabhupada. No, no, we, we're going to ask you questions, answered the man. Prabhupada was insistent, but can I ask you questions? The man glanced nervously at his colleagues. He said, yes, yes, later on. Srila Prabhupada appeared satisfied with the answer. The man's inquiries were predictably superficial, dwelling on social issues. At one stage, the man asked what the devotees were going to do about the city council's attempts to stop the devotees chanting on the streets of Sydney. Prabhupada told him about Lord Chaitanya's original civil disobedience movement. The Muslim magistrate, he said, had tried similar repression 500 years before in Bengal, but Lord Chaitanya had arranged 100,000 men to perform Sankirtan in the city, and the magistrate's attempts were foiled. After several more minutes, the cameras stopped rolling and the bright lights were turned off. The crew started packing up. OK, Swami, the man said, now you can ask questions. Throughout the interview, Prabhupada had sat back on the bolster cushions with half-closed eyes, appearing a little disinterested and very subdued. From an external point of view, he appeared tired. Prabhupada had not slept that night. The devotees were surprised as Prabhupada suddenly sat bolt upright, resting his left arm on the big polished desk and pointing his right index finger at the interviewer. Prabhupada, now given the opportunity to speak, appeared instantly refreshed. His eyes were wide open and bright. What's the difference, Prabhupada asked, between an animal and a man? The interviewer was taken aback and flustered. Uh, the, the man has intelligence and the animal doesn't? The man hesitated. Prabhupada didn't accept his answer. He proceeded to explain that animals also have intelligence. He gave the example of how a mouse uses its powers of discrimination to search out and eat cheese. But he said that whereas the animal's intelligence is directed towards basic physical propensities, the human intelligence is best directed towards God-realization. Prabhupada continued to, to, to preach until, after a few minutes, the man looked at his watch and spoke up nervously. Uh, well, I, I, I think you've got me there. I've got, I've got to go, he said. The session was over. Whatever material the men would use from the interview or whether or not it would even go to air was up to them. But Prabhupada's purpose was always the same, whether addressing a packed temple speaking all night in his room to a lone disciple, translating or speaking to the media, Prabhupada used every occasion as an opportunity to glorify Lord Krishna. The, the interesting thing was that actually Srila Prabhupada, um, when he spoke to the media, he was speaking to whichever media person he was speaking to at the time as if he was just a spirit soul lost in the material world and Prabhupada was not speaking to him as a representative of Channel 9 or Channel 10 or Channel 7 or thinking that this might go to air, so I'm going to have to speak in a certain way. Prabhupada just spoke to the person as if he was a spirit soul, and he didn't discriminate whether he was a, a media person or a regular person. So Prabhupada was just seeing everything, vidya vinaya sampane, brahmane gavihastini. He saw everyone as a soul inside a body whether he be animal, man, or whatever. Later that morning, another media man, this time a reporter from Sydney's Daily Mirror, not, a, not such a high-class newspaper, the Daily Mirror, came to the temple for an interview. It actually came out twice a day in, in those days, two newspapers a day. 
Uh, he was mainly interested in the Sydney City Council's latest attempts to quell the devotees' Sankirtan efforts. These things were starting to warm up, starting to warm up. Um, a little bit of antagonism towards Sankirtan was starting to cook. Um, so he wanted to know, what's the, what's the latest? What's the goss? What's the latest information about the Sydney City Council? Um, and he was plying enthusiastically uh, Mohanananda with questions. Halfway through the interview, Jagatarini chanced to walk past. That's the wife of Burijana Prabhu, and she was in Sydney at the time. Mohanananda um, half, uh, introduced, took the opportunity to introduce her to the press reporter um, as a former movie star, which, which she was who, after starring with Mick Jagger in an internationally acclaimed movie, had now renounced everything to become a devotee. The reporter's interest quickly turned to Jagatarini, who, as the photographer flashed away with his camera, was happy to answer his remaining questions. The article said the reporter would appear in Tuesday's edition of the newspaper. After taking a little prasadam, the man left. Jagatarini was a press magnet, People were very interested in her and what she had to say. So, a speaking engagement had been arranged for Srila Prabhupada at Sydney University. <clears throat> in the afternoon, a large group of devotees accompanied Srila Prabhupada in the double-decker bus to the outskirts of the grounds, very, very ancient, old university grounds, Sydney University. Srila Prabhupada walked regularly with the Kirtan procession as it wound through the central walkways of the campus. Quite a um, nice place. There's beautiful pictures of Prabhupada walking on the grounds of the university. Devotees carried framed pictures of Krishna and the Maha Mantra. Others carried various necessities for the engagement. Passing a group of student hecklers, hecklers, yes. The, the university's students in those days were pretty, pretty low grade. Um, the entourage entered a large hall with a stage where Srila Prabhupada sat on a makeshift asana. Despite extensive advertising, however, only a small number of students attended. The devotees were disappointed, although Srila Prabhupada seemed not to mind. The program started with the kirtan, then as Chiru held the microphone, the devotees had forgotten the microphone stand, um, Prabhupada spoke with his eyes closed gave a f and gave a full long lecture, as if, as if there was a huge audience. Prabhupada didn't discriminate, audience or not. Prabhupada's uh, spiritual master had told him that if there's no one in, in attendance, then speak to the four walls. No, there's no loss. Afterwards, some devotees quietly expressed their dissatisfaction with the small turnout. Upendra told the, the devotees the story of an even smaller program in the early days of New York. Devotees had apologized to Srila Prabhupada for bringing him to a program to which practically no one had come. But Prabhupada raised his eyebrows and had said, No one? Did you not see Narada? Did you not see Lord Brahma? Where there is chanting of Hare Krishna, even the demigods come to participate. That happened on a number of occasions. The devotees again drove Srila Prabhupada to the temple in the double-decker bus for the evening program. It was the highlight of our day. We, we crowded into the bus and it was like a big joy ride. It was certainly a, a, a joyous ride. Prabhupada was there and it took 20 minutes or so to get to the temple. So we, had a, we would have a big kirtan in the bus. I say we, but I, I didn't attend because I was at the temple cooking. So I missed out on everything. That's the story of my life. After the Bhagavad Gita class, Nanda Kumar led a particularly sweet and ecstatic kirtan. Such a wonderful kirtan leader. Big, strong man, muscly, and he played the drum like it was... Uh, your hair would stand on end when he played the madanga. Prabhupada was playing kartals with his eyes closed and looking intense, uh, with intense concentration on his face. Suddenly, Nanda Kumara's hand went right through the large head of the drum. Prabhupada opened his eyes abruptly and looked very sternly at Nanda Kumara, who brought the gear down quickly to a close. Afterwards, Nanda Kumar went to Srila Prabhupada to apologize. To apologize. What happened? asked Srila Prabhupada. I don't know, said Nanda Kumar. I didn't hit it too hard. 
Later on, it was discovered that the drum had been released from Sydney Airport quarantine only that morning, where the drum had been dipped in formaldehyde. Typical health department. Dip it in formaldehyde, effectively ruining it. So, you know, just because it was made from animal skin, um, you may get some terrible, you know, disease from bringing the drum, in, the drum into the country. And so dipping it in formaldehyde would kill the bacteria and it would destroy the drum. It lasted one half of a day. Next time, he suggested to Nandakumar to avoid such problems, if we take drums to Australia, we should be sure that the heads are of special pre-tanned leather, not raw hide. Um, Prabhupada commented that the first time he went to Australia, he brought mangoes and they confiscated the mangoes. And he was disgusted. He said, these mangoes were picked last night. He said, they were brought on, on, on the plane this morning. They're fresh and you've confiscated the mangoes. But he said, dried meat you can bring into the country. Such foolishness. Tuesday, 4th of April, 1972, Churu had been successful in arranging Srila Prabhupada to appear on a number of Sydney television shows. The first one was scheduled for 7.30 a.m., the popular live-to-air breakfast time chat show, Sydney Today, hosted by Andrew Harwood. Alas, Andrew Harwood is no more. Um, this was 50 years ago. Prabhupada travelled to the Channel 7 studios in a car with some of his senior disciples, whilst about 10 brahmachari follow, brahmacharis followed in the Volkswagen van. While everyone sat in the reception room waiting to go on, Mohanananda introduced all the devotees present, one by one, to Srila Prabhupada. There's a very nice picture of this. Describing their specific ability or service, Mohanananda was very personal and nice. The devotees felt excited to be personally introduced to their spiritual master. On air, Srila Prabhupada and Andrew Harwood sat side by side on soft, vinyl-covered swivel chairs as the devotees sat cross-legged on the floor. Some held copies of Prabhupada's Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita. At one point, Andrew asked Prabhupada about the ongoing court cases with the Sydney City Council. It seems you people can't even go out chanting on the streets these days without getting fines or being arrested, said Andrew. What will you do if this continues? Prabhupada's answer was short and to the point. We will go somewhere else. Hmm. And, uh, and uh, what about your dress? Don't you think your dress alienates, alienates people? Oh, dress is not that important. We can wear shirt, coat, pants like yourself. The dress is not important, he said. The important thing is to become God conscious. The interview was brief. After three minutes, it was over. And Srila Prabhupada and the devotees returned to the temple. So it was like an hour and a half drive to the, to the TV station. And then an, half an hour to 45 minutes waiting in the wings and then a three-minute interview, and then another huge trek back to the temple. But nevertheless, Prabhupada did it in order to preach. Srila Prabhupada received a copy of the foreword to the soon-to-be-published unabridged version of Bhagavad Gita as it is. Professor Edward C. Dimock, Jr. from the Department of South Asian Languages and Civilization at the University of Chicago had written. Now, if you recall, um, Prabhupada was uh, 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 reading from his recently written uh, foreword to the Bhagavad Gita on his last visit. And now the foreword uh, had been sent to him and the, and the book was just about to be published. And he read um, uh, from the book as follows. This text, this book, it said, is a, is a welcome edition from many points of view. It can serve as a valuable textbook for the college student. It allows us to listen to a skilled interpreter explicating a text which has profound religious meaning. It gives us insights into the original and highly convincing ideas of the Gaudiya Vaishnava school. It prov uh, in providing the uh, Sanskrit in both 
Devanagari and transliteration, it offers the Sanskrit specialist the opportunity to reinterpret or debate particular Sanskrit meaning. Although I think there will be little disagreement about the quality of the Swami's Sanskrit scholarship. And finally, for the non-specialist there is readable English and a devotional attitude which cannot but help move the sensitive reader. Uh, and there are the paintings, which incredibly, as it may seem to those familiar with contemporary Indian religious art, were done by American disciples. The scholar, the student of Gaudiya Vaishnavism, and the increasing number of Western readers interested in classical Vedic thought have been done a great service by Swami Bhaktivedanta, by bringing us a new and living interpretation of the text already known to many, he has increased our understanding many-fold. Unquote. Prabhupada approved of the foreword. The introduction by Mr. Dimok is nice, he replied to Rupanuga, and it will appear, it will, and it will appeal to the scholarly class, said Prabhupada. Jagatarini had just arrived at Prabhupada's house, ready to assist Upendra with Srila Prabhupada's lunch. This is the, uh, the day after the Daily Mirror reporter had come to interview Mohanananda and had chanced uh, upon seeing Jagatarini. And he was asking her all sorts of questions about her movie career. That seemed to be his interest. And she tried to direct the conversation more towards Krishna and he try to find out more information about working with Mick Jagger and other mundane subjects. Jagatarini had just arrived at Prabhupada's house ready to assist Upendra with Srila Prabhupada's lunch. When Mohanananda came rushing in with the Daily Mirror, he excitedly thrust it into Jagatarini's hands. Check out page five, he said with a grin. Jagatarini thumbed through the newspaper and saw to her mixed pleasure and horror the three-page, the three-quarter page article headed Ned Kelly Star Joins Hare Krishna. The article mainly described how she had renounced her promising movie career to serve Krishna. Look at Mick's girl now, the article announced. Mick Jagger's girlfriend is washing God's pots. Two half-page photographs accompanied the article. On the right, of the page was a photograph of Jagatrini in a sari standing demurely outside the temple's pot washing shed. Washing God's pots. She was smiling chastely and holding a kitchen colander in her hand. But the other photo made her wince. Announcing the two faces of Jan, the paper had chosen to feature another far less chaste photo from her television past, playing a role in a local series. How inappropriate, thought Jagatarini. Suddenly Mohananda snatched the paper from her hands. I'm taking it upstairs to show Srila Prabhupada, he said with a grin. Despite Jagatrini's, despite Jagatrini's protests, the paper quickly disappeared upstairs. Jagatarini was morose. Although the article and the recent photograph were nice, the other photo was something she would never want a devotee to see, least of all her spiritual master. She sat down, too depressed, to enter the kitchen. Prabhupada was seated on a saffron cushion behind his polished wooden desk. As Mohanananda placed the open newspaper before him, Prabhupada put on his glasses and studied the article. He looked up at the few senior men in his room who all moved in closer. Just see, Prabhupada said, with a grin. Pointing at the before shot of Jan, trying to look sultry with false eyelashes and heavy makeup. He said, in this photograph, she looks very morose. Prabhupada then pointed to the chaste aftershot outside the pot shed. But in this picture, he said, she looks very beautiful. Prabhupada is very interesting because, you know, from a mundane point of view, you would think, well, before she was wearing makeup and now she's not wearing makeup. But Prabhupada didn't see it like that. He, he saw this was in some dark period of her life when she was not a devotee. And now she's got tilak and she's looking effulgent uh, after washing Krishna's pots. Prabhupada chuckled. But the materialist, he will see it the other way. Prabhupada glanced at the article and picked out one paragraph 
which seemed to exactly confirm his conclusion. Now, Prabhupada read, Jan looks more ecstatic than Mick Jagger could ever make her. <laughs> Prabhupada became serious. My disciples, he said, their previous history is all black. Before they became devotees, they were eating meat, they were having illicit sex, taking intoxicants. We do not want to discuss it. We, we don't even want to think about it, he said. Prabhupada paused, looking up with a sweep of his hand indicating the newspaper article. He said softly, Krishna has saved her from all this nonsense. That evening, before driving to the temple, Prabhupada sat for a short while in the downstairs lounge while Nandakumar brought his shoes. Jagatrini came before him, offered her obeisances and sat looking somewhat ashamed. Prabhupada appeared totally at ease and spoke to her with affection. You are so lucky, he said. Krishna has saved you, he reiterated. Prabhupada paused, thinking for a moment, and then he spoke again, looking intently at Jagatarini. Always remain a devotee, he said. You have had so many lives. Just give this one for Krishna. Then you may do whatever you want, but this one is for Krishna. A second television interview was booked for the evening. Controversial Sydney TV personality Bob Rogers. Huh. The notorious Bob Rogers. Famous for grilling people and embarrassing them and bringing them to tears. TV personalities in those days used to be, uh, that used to be their style. Of course, Bob Rogers has also moved on to, the, to another life. Bob Rogers hosted a program of music, comedy and talk, specialising in interviewing top-name guests from both locally and abroad. Srila Prabhupada and his entourage squeezed into a taxi for another long drive to ATN 7 Studios in Epping. Such a long trip. A few other devotees joined them on site. Chiru recalls, We had to sit in the waiting room for quite a while before going on, on set. Meanwhile, a wall-mounted television monitor was screening a movie depicting a graphic rape scene in a swamp. That's the uh, standard of Australian TV at the time. Basically, they were just showing what was on TV at that moment. Um, I was shocked. It was the most explicit material I had ever seen on television. I glanced over at Prabhupada. He watched for a few moments and then he looked at us. He was smiling. It was not a smile of pleasure, though. It was a smile of sadness. Then Prabhupada shook his head with disbelief and looked down. Perhaps he had never witnessed such a thing before in his life. Certainly, it would have been hard to imagine the mentality that prompted broadcasting such material to the public. Prabhupada's look said, this is unbelievable. On air, Bob seemed uncomfortable, even a little agitated since his questions were of the trivial variety, and since his mood was somewhat condescending, Prabhupada reciprocated by looking very grave. At one stage, Bob asked why the devotees chanted. Prabhupada explained briefly, still with a very serious expression, about the Sankirtan movement. You say that this chanting makes people happy, Bob challenged, but you, you don't seem very happy. Exhibiting the same solemn appearance, Prabhupada replied, Oh, we are happy, he paused, and added, Very happy. Prabhupada's countenance suddenly changed, his eyes lit up and sparkled, he gave a broad smile, and he started to laugh. To the devotees present who had been feeling a little uncomfortable, it was as if the sun had come out on a rainy day. They all spontaneously uttered, Jai, Prabhupada, Jai. Bob embarrassed, changed the subject, and after another question, it was all over. Another three-minute event. In the taxi on the way back to the temple, Chiru outlined his plans for the two or three more national TV shows that he had lined up, but Prabhupada cut him off. He appeared disgusted. They do not know how to ask questions, he said. Tell them 
that they have to give me at least half an hour. Otherwise, I will not go. Next morning, Cheru rang around the TV stations with Prabhupada's ultimatum, but no one could offer more than 10 minutes maximum. So uh, future TV plans were dropped. And that was the last time Prabhupada spoke on TV, in Australia anyway. Actually, no. I, I'm, I'm incorrect. He spoke again in 1976 for another interview. And then they didn't even, they hardly even showed it. Prabhupada spoke for mm, half an hour, 45 minutes at that later event, and then it ended up being one minute and 10 seconds or something. That's the uh, potluck when you record stuff for television. So the next day in Sydney, Wednesday, the 5th of April, 1972, coming up for 50 years ago. After five busy days of preaching in Sydney, Srila Prabhupada flew to Melbourne, Melbourne, the capital of the state of Victoria. As the Ansett Airlines flight landed at Melbourne's Tullamarine Airport, about 20 devotees chanted loudly near Arrival Bay 3. You could get very close to the aeroplanes in those days, practically inside the jet engines, just with a glass in between. But uh, later on, of course, they made it a bit more secure. Um, airport officials objected to the noise, but the devotees chanted anyway, right in the air airport, with the full blast of cartels and wampers and madunga. We were uncompromising. This was Prabhupada's first visit to Melbourne. Wow. For many of the devotees who lived in the fledgling temple, it was to be their premier chance for personal association with their spiritual master, about whom they had heard so much. The kirtan reached a climax, then abruptly ended. As Prabhupada emerged, devotees showered him with marigolds and purple dahlias, and prostrated themselves on the floor. Prabhupada walked briskly to the VIP lounge for a pre-arranged press conference, and the chanting resumed. While press and television, television news crews rushed to set up their lights and cameras, <coughs> excuse me, Prabhupada sat down cross-legged on a soft chair and accompanied the chanting with his cartels. He sat gravely, covered in garlands, uh, surveying the small band of devotees that sat before him. There was a picture in the newspaper the next day. Beside him, uh, on the wall, Prabhupada had mounted a bright red poster. I'm sorry, behind him on the wall. The devotees had mounted a bright red poster poster advertising Prabhupada's speaking engagements over the next few days. That, that bright red poster was seen all over Melbourne. We went out at night and posted up like 10,000 of them on all the walls and the bridges and, and lampposts and amazing. The whole Melbourne was bright red for the next week. The questions came quickly. Uh, what's your purpose in coming to Australia? Asked one reporter. My purpose is coming, in coming is to broadcast the message of love of God achievable through the chanting of the holy names Hare Krishna. By chanting the Maha Mantra, the heart become, becomes cleansed of all dirty things. But aren't you withdrawing from life? No, we are also working, we are eating, we are sleeping, we, we do everything while other people are concerned with the material necessities of life though. We are concerned with the spiritual necessities. A reporter asked about Christianity. Prabhupada answered frankly that Christianity was a failure because you do not know exactly what is God. If I ask you what is God, you can't tell me. There was a great need, he explained, for God consciousness everywhere. Therefore, he said, he traveled everywhere just as a salesman travels everywhere. A salesman, he said, looks for customers wherever he can find them. Similarly, he was traveling, searching for anyone intelligent enough to accept his message. There is no difference in coming to Australia, he said. The government have made demarcations. This is Australia, but we see everywhere as the land of Krishna. 
and Prabhupada certainly did do some business while he was in Australia as a salesman, travels for customers. Srila Prabhupada certainly did uh, pick up many disciples on that first visit. Many devotees who saw Prabhupada for that first visit became serious devotees at that time. And serious devotees, they still are, some of them, to this very day. The Melbourne Temple at 14 Burnett Street was a neat white terrace house nestling between a private hotel and a line of other standard late Victorian terrace houses in the centre of the beachside suburb of St Kilda. Although St Kilda's name had now become synonymous with crime, drugs and prostitution, it had not always been so. There was a time in the 1860s when St Kilda was the best address in Melbourne. Those that ruled Victoria lived there on elegant estates. In the early part of the century, St Kilda became the entertainment centre of Victoria. Its Lunar Park, fashioned after New York's Coney Island, was the newest, greatest and best amusement park in the world when it opened in 1912. During the tumultuous Second World War years, St Kilda hosted American troops on rest and recreation. And in the post-war years, the city was now the first home for many newly arrived refugees from Europe. Although not losing its cosmopolitan appeal, St Kilda was certainly no longer a fashionable address. But the area offered easy access to the city, a short tram or train ride, and most importantly for the devotees, the rent was cheap. In fact, the temple used to be a brothel before we moved in. It had been transformed into Krishna's temple. Most devotees had gone to the airport to greet Srila Prabhupada. Some stayed back, however, frantically scraping off the last spots of paint from the freshly varnished temple room floor. Yes, that was a common event when Prabhupada arrived. As the last bucket of rose-scented water splashed across the front footpath, a dark red limousine pulled up at the curbside. Prabhupada stepped out of the car, entered the front gate and walked down the little path. Tins of paint were whisked away from beside still wet walls and gangplanks were hast hastily removed from the shiny temple floor. We'd just polished it. The room had just been polished and the walls had still be, uh, were still wet from painting. That was our life. Srila Prabhupada had reached the temple before most of the devotees and only a handful, some still in their paint, um, paint bespeckled work clothes, were there to greet him. The narrow front Narrow fronted terrace house was deceptively, deceptively extensive inside, although none of the ten rooms were particularly large. It had a very narrow frontage, but it went back for a block and a half, actually. The, current, uh, the curtains were closed, apart from the sunlight that streamed uh, through the front windows, the temple was not illuminated because they were still working on the deity room. The deity room hadn't been completed. So the deity room closed, the curtains had been closed. Devotees in overalls who had been sticking the last bits of new altar together, gosh, they were still building the altar, hastily emerged from behind the curtain, their hands covered in quick-drying cement. Krishna Premi, holding back her tears, started leading a kirtan with harmonium as devotees rushed in from the airport. The devotees, uh, actually, Krishna Premi always used to cry when when Prabhupada arrived. The temple started to fill. Someone offered a plate of simply wonderfuls to Prabhupada, who indicated that they be distributed to the assembled devotees. Prabhupada appeared pleased with the work the devotees had done in readying the new temple. What's the rent? he asked Hanuman, who had just raced in from the airport. Hanuman largely responded, sorry, he loudly responded, $34 a week, he said. Not bad for ten rooms. Um, Prabhupada nodded in approval, looking around the room at the eager young boys and girls who, as neophytes, knew practically nothing of spiritual life and in most cases very little of material life. 
Prabhupada knew that many of them had already been significantly ruined by illicit sex and drugs. Some were, in Prabhupada's terms, rich men's sons, but they had become hippies wandering the streets. Prabhupada, however, was confident that because they were sincerely taking to Krishna consciousness, their shortcomings would not prevent their spiritual progress. Prabhupada had explained in his Krishna book that although naturally beautiful, the Western youths were now dirty and morose. Their beauty had been covered, but now, just as peacocks in Vrindavan began to dance jubilantly, jubilantly at the onset of the rainy season, as the monsoons revive the dry lands, similarly, those youths were being revived by their chanting of the holy names and were dancing ecstatically. Prabhupada had pointed out in a letter to a devotee in London only the day before, practically, I am observing here in Australia that you Western boys and girls are becoming angels by taking up this Krishna consciousness process. After speaking some encouraging words, Prabhupada then departed for his room upstairs, promising to speak again that night. Prabhupada's reason for travelling to Melbourne was mainly to train and convince his disciples. Out of the nine processes of devotional service, to Lord Krishna, Prabhupada had explained that the first process, hearing, was the most important. Without hearing sufficiently from authentic, authentic sources like Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita, no one could make progress in spiritual life. Thus, for the devotees, hearing directly from a, their spiritual master was the highlight of his few days with them. In the evening, Prabhupada spoke to a packed temple room from chapter 13 of Bhagavad Gita, verse 2. The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, This body, O son of Kunti, is called the field, and one who knows the field, and one who knows this body, is called the knower of the field. Prabhupada used to speak a lot on that, that verse from Bhagavad Gita. Prabhupada spoke about the body and the owner of the body, Chetra and Chetragya. Chetra means field, And just like a tiller, an agriculturalist, Prabhupada said, he is given a certain tract of land and he tills and produces grains or some vegetables or something edible. Similarly, Prabhupada said, this body is the field and I am, or you are, who is occupying this body. We are tillers. This body is given by nature and I am the spirit soul. Just like one may may possess very valuable land, one may possess land not so valuable, ordinary, and one may possess a third-class field. Similarly, we living entities, we are given a certain type of body to enjoy with, uh, and, and, or suffer the result of an action. Somebody is very highly intelligent. Somebody is not so intelligent. Somebody is very rich. Somebody is very poor. Someone is middle class. Someone is an animal. Someone is a tree. Someone is an insect. Someone is an aquatic Prabhupada uh, uh, described that. Although there are many varieties of life, many uh, modern universities and educational institutions cannot ascertain the exact number. They cannot say, he said. But if you consult the Vedic literatures, you'll find exactly the number. Jalaja Navalakshani. In the water, it is said, the aquatic living beings are 900,000 different bodies. So I don't think there is any biologist or botanist who can say exactly how many forms of life there are within the water. We have got information, Prabhupada continued, from Vedic literature that there is a fish which is called Timingila. Timi means whale fish. These Timingila fish swallow up whale fish like this. Prabhupada made a face. That's a Timingila fish eating a whale in one gulp. The devotees laughed to see Prabhupada's perfect caricature. Similarly, the Vedic literature gives information. Stavada lakshavimsati. Stavada means the living entities who cannot move. Srila Prabhupada gave an astonishing example. Listen carefully. This is quite an astonishing example. Here, by the side of the wall, this house... He said, there is a tree. 
Now, um, I don't know when Prabhupada saw that tree. I presume that he might have seen that tree the day before, when uh, the morning of this day, when he took his massage. Uh, Prabhupada used to take his massage in the outer part of the back courtyard, and there, astonishingly, uh, Prabhupada tells this story. Here, by the side of the wall, this house, there is a tree. It actually had grown out of the concrete. You know when sometimes trees are so eager to survive that they burst through the concrete. So there was a tree. It, it was adjoining the building. It was actually just in the crack between the wall of the building and the ground, and it had burst out, probably doing havoc with the foundations of the house. It was quite a, at least 50 years old, and it was about this wide and it had grown out of the concrete, and Prabhupada had noticed it. Here by the side of the wall, this house, there is a tree, he said. It has grown. Just see, that tree is not even within the jungle. In a small space it, it has grown, all sides, surrounded by the house, and it is alone. Just see how much condemned life. Other trees, they are at least in the jungle, in the society of trees. Prabhupada was so concerned with the life of this tree that he was sad that this tree had to live alone. We never give these things a second thought, but Prabhupada was talking about a society of trees, like trees also need companionship. The devotees laughed at his example that the tree was alone. But this tree, he said, we have to consider how this tree has been so much condemned. The tree is condemned because... You are human beings. You are sitting here. If you like, you can stand up and you can walk around, but the tree cannot move. Stand up there, he said. Stand up there. By whose order? By God's order. You must stand up. Don't take this neg 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 neglectfully, Prabhupada said. This is a serious subject. According to Vedic calculation, this tree that has grown here was sometimes the owner or previous occupier of this house. And it had been so much attached to this house that now it cannot go out of the house. Therefore, he has been given this body of a tree. All right, you live here and stand up. The devotees were amazed to hear this description of the identity of the young, solitary Rus tree, which had grown from the concrete yard at the side of the house. Prabhupada continued, sometimes we become ghosts. If we become too much attached, we cannot leave. Therefore, too much opulent apartment, opulent life is not very good for spiritual advancement because we get too much attached to it. My Guru Maharaj used to advise us, it is better to live in a rented house than to possess one's own house. Why? Because if we possess our own house, we become more attached this attachment sometimes leads to becoming a tree, a mouse, becoming a snake in the same house. After all, you may purchase a nice house, you may decorate it very nicely, but you have to leave it. You cannot live here permanently. It is not possible. Prabhupada concluded by saying that just as there are different qualities of fields, the human body is the best type of body for inquiring into the Absolute Truth. Atato Brahmajigyasa. Therefore, the Vedanta Sutra says that this life is simply meant for inquiry into the Supreme. That's all. The animals cannot do it. So simply, if we waste our time just like the animals, then we glide down to the animal kingdom. That is a great loss. After many, many births, we have got this human form of life. If we simply waste it like the cats and dogs, then again we become a cat or a dog or a tree. That is a great loss. Havoc. Therefore, our this Krishna consciousness movement is to educate people to God consciousness or Krishna consciousness so that this life may be successful. Thank you very much. We spoke about that example a lot afterwards um, that Prabhupada had given about this tree. Um, this tree was growing up the side of the building and remarkably, when it got to the top of the building, the branches um, 
had started to grow inwards and as if the tree was trying to get back into the house. And it made sense to us that now that Prabhupada had said that this was the previous owner or occupier of the house, it was as if the tree uh, wanted to get back into the house. It, it was qualified to take its birth near the house, but it couldn't actually get in the house. And what to speak of enjoy in the house? How much enjoyment is, is there in the body of a tree? Um, so afterwards, um, we started to pour the Mahaprasadam water on the tree. We used to hang the garlands from the deities on the tree. Madhavisa Swami used to hang his underwear from the branches of the tree. We used to engage the tree in devotional service because we were thinking, well, at least now, after the tree, uh, life is over. The, the poor spirit soul that's inside this tree's body will get a chance of making spiritual advancement because now it has been noticed by Srila Prabhupada and it has been given prasadam by the devotees. After the evening program, Mohan Ananda, who had traveled down to Melbourne with Srila Prabhupada, asked him frankly in his room which temple he preferred, Sydney or Melbourne. Mm, a leading question. With a smile, Prabhupada answered that as far as the decoration was concerned, although the Sydney altar was better, it appeared that the Melbourne temple had done a better job overall. Mohan Ananda excused himself and immediately rushed to a telephone and rang Sydney Temple to break the news and offer some advice. Mahananda was stirring us up to do better. Transcendental competition. Since Prabhupada was returning to Sydney in four days' time, because Prabhupada went Sydney, Melbourne, Sydney, he was coming back in four days, so he suggested to the Sydney devotees that you have four days left to get the Sydney Temple even better. So we went on a huge work marathon, as quick as possible. And he added, Mohanananda added in his uh, characteristic flamboyant style, money is no object. The transcendental competition continued. Thursday, the 6th of April, 1972. This was really an action-packed visit to, to Australia. The day was set for the installation of Sri Sri Radha and Krishna. These are the same beautiful Radha and Krishna deities that are still gracing the Melbourne temple to this very day a beautiful 14-inch uh, Astadatta um, metal deities of Radha and Krishna. Gorgeously beautiful. This day was set aside for the installation of Sri Sri Radha and Krishna. The initiation, of a, the initiation of a dozen or so devotees into the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra was also going to take place, as well as one marriage and the sannyas initiation of Hanuman Das. Srila Prabhupada came down to the temple room around mid-morning and sat down on a gold satin cushion on the floor before the newly completed altar, a very basic box-like wooden construction decorated with stenciled white swans and set atop three marble steps. There is a photograph of this that appeared in the Melbourne, A Melbourne Age newspaper, a famous picture, and you'll see it. It's online, it's in this book, it's around. Very nice picture. The devotees are sitting there in front of the sacrificial fire. I'm there because I'm getting my second initiation, and all the devotees are there who are getting their first initiations also, and uh, taken 50 years ago. Directly in front of Srila Prabhupada stood the beautiful 35 centimetre high deities. I guess that's around 12 or 14 inches. I, I can't think in centimetres. Um, oh, the deities of Radha and Krishna. With great care and attention, Prabhupada lovingly bathed them with a mixture of milk, yogurt, ghee, honey and sugar syrup. Panch Amrita. The devotees who eagerly looked on noted how attractive Krishna was with his large hips, thin waist and an enchanting threefold bending form. After the bathing ceremony, Prabhupada spoke intently to the boys and girls seated before him. So today you are getting initiation on this auspicious day when Lord Krishna and Radharani, his eternal consort, is now being established, installed. At this auspicious moment, you will be initiated to chant the Hare Krishna mantra in the beginning. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, 
Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. As it is indicated in this verse, Om Apavitraha Pavitro Va, Sarva Vastam Gato Piva, Yasmarit Punda Dikaksham, Sa Bahya Bhyantaraha, Suchihi, Sri Vishnu, Sri Vishnu, Sri Vishnu. He who remains always purified, Suchihi. Suchi means Brahmana, a purified man. A Brahmana must uh, remain uh, Suchi. This means the intellectual class of men who know the hygienic rules. He keeps himself always purified and engages in studying Vedic literatures for understanding the world. God himself and their relation. In this initiation ceremony, there will be some persons today who will be initiated for chanting the Hare Krishna Mahamantra, the holy names of Krishna. Some of them will be initiated for the second time, myself and a couple of others. Um, Jagaturini, um, a couple. Um, they were initiated before the chanting uh, of Hare Krishna Mantra. Now they are initiated with the sacred thread. No, Jagaturini wasn't. Uh, well, maybe she was. No, she was. She was also given her Brahman initiation at this time. Not in the assembly, but in Prabhupada's room after the ceremony. There were three or four of us. The sacred thread means recognition of complete Brahminical culture, Prabhupada said. The qualifications of Brahmana is Satya, Dhamma, Sama, Tatiksha, Arjavam, Gyanam, Vigyanam, Astikyam, Brahma, Karma, Svabhavajam. Prabhupada described these Brahminical symptoms and gave examples. Tatiksha means toleration. There may be many tribulations, but a Brahmana is supposed to be very, very tolerant. First class example of toleration in the Western world is Lord Jesus Christ. He was crucified. He did not take any steps. If he wanted, he could have taken steps, but he was tolerating. So this is a sign of Brahminical life. Prabhupada then called the devotees forward to receive their beads on spiritual names. Doug was a young, slightly, build, slightly built artist. Your name is Domiadas, one of the commanders in the battlefield of Kurukshetra. Domiadas uh, regretfully passed away some years ago in a car accident. John became Jayadharma named after one of the Acharyas in the Madhva Gaudiya Sampradaya. Jaya Dharmadas is living in northern Australia. He's a famous uh, Ayurvedic doctor. And he's known as the... Um, um, I forget his name. He's got a nickname. Um, he is uh, very well known in the northern regions of Australia. Um, and uh, John's girlfriend at the time... Della became Deva Darshana, one who can see all the demigods. Mignon became Mekala, the belt of the universe. Mekala. She was the young lady who was a ballet dancer before she had become a devotee and she had moved into the temple. She prayed one day, I'm suffering so much. God, if you exist, please help me. And that day she received a Back to Godhead magazine. She visited the temple. She moved in. She gave up her ballet life and she became Mekala. Mekala passed away last year. Sharon became Satyavati. Uh, Satyavati is living somewhere in uh, New Zealand I think. And Steve, the young Greek boy, became Sanaka. Sanaka. He became the temple president of Melbourne after some time and uh, he passed away two years ago also. Srila Prabhupada asked each of these devotees to pledge that they would chant 16 rounds every day and would indulge in no meat eating, no intoxication, no gambling, or no illicit sex life. Since his arrival in America in 1965, Prabhupada had noted how young Western boys and girls mixed unrestrictedly. Many of these boys and girls had joined the Krishna consciousness movement as boyfriend and girlfriend. There had been no question of asking newcomers to give up their partners, yet he uncompromisingly preached no illicit sex. This dilemma had an obvious solution, however, marry the couples in Krishna consciousness. Traditionally, a sannyasi would never arrange or perform marriages, but Prabhupada gave priority to spreading 
Krishna consciousness. Jaidama and Deva Darshana were full-time devotees now who lived near the Melbourne temple as boyfriend and girlfriend. Prabhupada now was getting them married. Krishna conscious married life, the Grihastha ashram, would be the best arrangement for many of his new aspiring disciples, he said. In Krishna consciousness, husband and wife could live together and help one another in spiritual progress. After the various ceremonies of exchanging garlands, placing vermilion in the part of the wife's hair, covering her head, circumambulation of the groom by the bride, Prabhupada stressed to the young couple the seriousness of married life. So you have agreed that there is no question of divorce in your life. In any circumstances, you cannot separate. Is that all right? Do you agree? You cannot separate. There is no question of divorce. Even if you fight, you can remain in one temple, he can remain in another temple, but there is no question of divorce. So take in mind, that's all. Next, Shamasundara assisted Srila Prabhupada in preparing the fire sacrifice. The fire blazed as it was fed with more and more fuel. As the flames leapt higher, the transcendental sound vibration of the chanting of the Vedic mantras sanctified the already auspicious day. Finally, Hanuman Das, standing in the smoky temple before the sacrificial fire, was handed his sannyas staff by Shamasundara and given his name by Srila Prabhupada, Hanuman Prasad Goswami. The conch shell blew and the white folding doors of the deity room drew back. Prabhupada and the devotees bowed down before the deities of Radha and Krishna, now dressed in their new white satin and lavender brocade outfit, lovingly sewn by Chitraleka Devi Dasi. Hanuman Prasad Goswami concluded the happy event with an exuberant kirtan. Franco, Bhakta Franco at the time, recalls. Back to Franco was Italian, but I'm not going to speak with an Italian accent, although he has one. I was standing in the smoky temple room at the doorway just before the arati ceremony was going to start. I was a photographer at the time, and I was trying to get a good clear photograph of Srila Prabhupada. Many other photographers were there, were there on that day, and I found myself near the door of the temple room. As I was looking through the viewfinder, Srila Prabhupada suddenly turned and looked at me. I immediately took the photograph. I was also developing my own photographs, and a couple of days later, I brought the photograph back and showed it to Upendra. Prabhupada's eyes were moist, and he appeared somber, perhaps even a little sad in the photo. Prabhupada showed this photograph to Srila Prabhupada after it had been developed. Srila Prabhupada, Upendra said, you seem very sad in this picture. No, answered Srila Prabhupada. I was feeling great ecstasy. 500 years ago, each of the six Goswamis of Vrindavan had had his own deity for whom he had built a beautiful temple. But Prabhupada was empowered to install and maintain many deities, Rukmini Dwarkadish in Los Angeles, Radha Govinda in New York, Radha Londonishwara in London, Radha Madhava in Mayapur, and in Sydney, Radha Gopinath. All were Prabhupada's worshipable deities, Acha Vigraha incarnations of Radha and Krishna, uh, appearing at the request of their pure devotee for the benefit of neophyte devotees in various places around the world. Now, Radha and Krishna had come to Melbourne and they were standing giving their eternal blessings and benedictions to the assembled devotees. The morning press had extensively covered Prabhupada's arrival. We rushed out to buy all the newspapers from the local milk bar. The age showed a picture of Srila Prabhupada with Hanuman in an article entitled Spiritual Master of the Universe Drops in by Jet. Under the caption, slightly sarcastic, but true. Under the caption, Swami gets a flower welcome, 
The Herald featured a large picture of Srila Prabhupada covered in garlands, walking through the Melbourne airport with devotees bowing before him. The Sun article, Tears Greet the Swami, which is true, was accompanied by two photographs, one of Srila Prabhupada sitting in the airport press lounge, lounge and another huge close-up picture of Prabhupada bowing down, no, sorry, another huge close-up picture of a devotee bowing down on the road outside the airport building. It was like half a page. A devotee with his head pressed into the wet asphalt. But, you know, this was the press at the time. It was nice, though. The devotee was looking very transcendental and ecstatic. Um, as Prabhupada's car drove off, all three articles presented favourable and accurate accounts of the event, which was... Um, which was good. Uh, we didn't always get accurate press, uh, press uh, coverage, but they were accurate. Behind Srila Prabhupada's room was a tiny two-metre square kitchenette. I remember it well. Tiny. It was about f five feet by five feet. There, each day, Chitraleka would prepare rasagulas for Prabhupada, who ate the sweets daily with his breakfast. I remember Chitraleka's rasgulas. Oh, she learned how to cook rasgulas from Yamuna Devi in Brindaban. And she would prepare them for Radha and Krishna. She taught us how to make milk sweets for Radha and Krishna. They were, they were like completely transcendental. So she was in that little kitchen every day making sweets for Prabhupada. Around mid-morning, Upendra in the same kitchen would prepare Prabhupada's lunch. A couple of devotees entered the kitchen while Upendra was cooking. Uh-oh. Before too long, Upendra, at, as was his sometimes frivolous habit, had reduced the conversation to a mundane gossip session. After the devotees left the kitchen, Prabhupada, from his adjoining room, suddenly called out for Upendra in an angry voice. Upendra, come in here. Upendra ran in. Prabhupada looked disturbed. Yes, Srila Prabhupada, what were you doing? I, I was just talking to some devotees. In the kitchen, Prabhupada shook his head in disgust. Gossip, he said. It will destroy this movement. After a few moments, Prabhupada dismissed Upendra, who, visibly shaken, offered his obeisances and left the room. Chitraleka recalls in her in interview with me, uh, Upendra immediately came downstairs and related the whole incident. He was mortified, as usual, from Prabhupada's chastisement. I guess he needed it, I guess he needed it said Chitraleka, because Upendra loved to gossip. I don't know whether Upendra was able to take the lesson to heart, but I certainly did. From that day, I made a conscious effort never to gossip about devotees. I'll read you one last little snippet. snippet. During his stay in Melbourne in 1972, Prabhupada often commented on the sweetness of the drinking water. I can still taste it to this day. Remarkable water. Coming from protected catchments to the north and east of the city, it was of particularly high quality and fresh tasting. Being a connoisseur of water, Prabhupada could distinguish its different tastes and qualities. He made his judgment. Since it gave him an appetite, it was good for his digestion. Melbourne water, Prabhupada concluded, was amongst the best that he had tasted in the world. And I'll vouch for that. Perhaps we'll never get to taste water like that. It was quite remarkable. But time and tide wait for no man. And that also brings us to the end of today's reading from The Great Transcendental Adventure. There's a lot of nectar here and there's a lot of nectar to come. As you can see, we're only a fifth of the way through the book. So stay tuned for more exciting readings from The Great Transcendental Adventure, pastimes of His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada in Australia and New Zealand. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Haribol! Haribol.